So welcome to this this wonderful opportunity we have to uh, kick off Reimagine's new series, The Phoenix Rising. Uh, Yet yeah, my name is Brad. I am the executive director and founder of Reimagine. We are a nonprofit organization, and you see on our screen right now our mission statement, which is really in the form of a question: How might we help all people face mortality? loss and adversity, and then channel the hard parts of life into meaningful action and growth. And you may have known about Reimagine more so for the work we've been doing over the last number of years around uh, end of life, and have really seen through our work the natural extension of these topics into adversity and trauma and all types of losses that we experience. And so, you know, we're all, we all are constantly experiencing these as part of our lives. So whoever you are, wherever you came from, there's a reason why you're here and you're in the right place. Uh, before we get going, I also want to invite you today, uh, our, our wonderful guest who I'll introduce soon, Ariel Schwartz, is hosting as part of this a, a workshop we're going to be engaged in, a creative uh, workshop to some degree, although no creative skill necessary. But what might be necessary is some kind of pen or, or colored uh, markers or um, colored pencils and some blank paper, anything you have of that variety, variety would be terrific for you to grab now um, while we're setting up. But you're going to need that as this session continues. So yes. So as I mentioned, this is part of Reimagine's fall theme. Reimagine grief, growth, and action. There are hundreds of events taking place on our platform right now, all on this theme that folks in our community like yourselves are creating for others in our network. And this is one of the experiences that Reimagine as an organization is hosting. And so if you're new to Zoom, I want to give you some background around how to use this, this tool that we're in. Uh, and even if you are not new, there's some important features here. For one, we're going to be using the chat today, as you've already experienced, by using that little chat button at the bottom and we'll be asking for questions and commentary back and forth through the chat so we encourage an active exciting dialogue thank you already if you're just joining us sharing where you're calling in from and also what's bringing you to the space today i also want to draw your attention to the closed captioning option uh, if you like a live transcript of what's taking place you can click that button and see it an ongoing manuscript of what's taking place i believe that's working uh, additionally today want to alert everyone that this event is being recorded, but none of you are being recorded. So note, note that this is a safe space and nothing you put in the chat will be shared in any future time. Only, only really Dr. Uh, R.L. Schwartz and myself will be on video. So want to let you know about that as well. So you know this is a, a safe space for all of us. I want to give a quick shout out to our 2021 sponsors. Now Reimagine uh, is a nonprofit, as I mentioned, and Thanks to these sponsors, we're able to offer free experiences like this uh, to you and, and to this community. And, and thank you so many of you who have contributed yourselves, your own resources to this. Uh, that's, that's really looks like that's someone will leave the bloody meeting. <laughs> All right. We're getting some. I heard a wonderful English accent, so thank you for joining. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to begin, we like to begin with our, our reimagined uh, intention for this, this fall season, and I want to invite my colleague Andy Ingle. Andy, if you're there, would you mind reading for us the intention that you were so uh, instrumental in, in crafting for us? There is no life without death, no love without loss, no growth without action. Let's move forward together, not in leaps and bounds, but in small, sweet steps. In the face of distance, illness, racism, and isolation, we are reimagining a changed world. Kinder, slower, smaller. We are reimagining the giving and receiving of love, the cycles of loss and new beginnings, and what it means to be fully alive. This is how we move. This is how we transform. This is how we grow. This is how we take action. Thank you, Andy, and I hope everyone can sink into those words and, and share with us this intention of, about why, why we're creating spaces like this right now. Uh, and today, 
we are going to be digging into the science of post-traumatic growth, both an ancient wisdom, really, and, and a modern science, a growing body of research that shows us that some people actually experience a positive psychological shift and improve mental well-being through adversity, loss, or trauma. Now, what Drew reimagined to this concept as an organization is some of the same things that we saw come out of these experiences that we've been hosting turn out to be the, the very measurable outcomes of uh, what's known as post-traumatic growth. It's been shown that after an experience of trauma, some people report increased personal strength, optimism for life's possibilities, more meaningful relationships, a deeper compassion and appreciation for life and each other, and, and even a deeper sense of existential, existential awareness and of purpose, spirituality, and community. It's, it's really incredible. I mean, myself, who is the, the grandson of Auschwitz survivors, I've seen this myself and my own grandmother. And when Reimagine talks about this term living fully, in many respects, these are some of the qualities that we see in what it means for us to really live a full life. Now, what is the relationship between these parts of life and trauma? That's what we, we want to explore with you today. And so there are these five st uh, elements that we can identify that can help us grow through loss and adversity. And Dr. Schwartz is going to speak to, to, to some of these related concepts in more detail. Uh, but first of all, it's knowing that growth is actually possible after something hard. Can we emotionally regulate ourselves and find mindfulness and find peace and cultivate that within ourselves? What does it look like to share our own stories in a safe community? There's, there's healing in that. And that's why we at Reimagine have created so many spaces and you've created so many spaces to create those safe spaces for one another. Then what does it look like to chart new goals for ourselves in the face of what we've experienced? And finally, what we've, what's been seen as, as very effective in cultivating um, growth through, through hardship are actually creating acts of service in the world of taking positive new actions, of creativity. And you look at these things, what does it mean to create an act of service? What is a positive action? What is creativity? The definitions can be pretty broad, and we're gonna explore some of that today with you as well. Knowing that we're all the heroes of our own journeys, but instead of slaying the dragon, in some senses, when we think of the hero's story, the hero's journey, here we're talking maybe more so about dancing, dancing with dancing with with life and all that it, that it, that it uh, lays out and for us and, and with us. So that's culminated today to announcing Phoenix Rising, Reimagine's five-part series exploring what it means to emerge from the ashes. This is the first of five sessions that are all free with some of the luminaries in this space, um, all exploring opportunities to emerge and transform adversity, loss, and mortality into meaningful growth and action. Our guest speakers are from diverse fields such as psychology, art, and activism, and they will help us dig into the scientific phenomenon of trauma-related growth through inspiring conversations and workshops. Tonight, I am so delighted to introduce to you uh, Dr. Ariel Schwartz, a licensed clinical psychologist, a certified yoga instructor, and an internationally sought out teacher. She is the author of five books, including the Post-Traumatic Growth Guidebook, which I highly recommend. It's, it's, it's been instrumental to our entire organization. She is a leading voice in the, in the treatment of PTSD through her integrative mind-body approach to therapy. She and her lovely family live in Boulder, Colorado, and she's here with us today. Dr. Schwartz, I want to welcome you to Reimagine and to this community, and thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Brad. It is such a joy to be here. Um, I just want to take a moment with the slide share down just to take in um, your faces. Um, those of you I've been uh, enjoying the chat, I have some uh, dear people uh, that I know well who are part of my community who've joined us here as well tonight. And it's, it's just such a um, joy to know that there's people that, you know, I have been in very deep healing spaces with. Um, pre-pandemic, right? And that there's new faces that we get to, in a way, kind of share that felt sense of connection and community together and, and weave together um, a, a new sense of community. Hi, Kelly, it's good to see your face. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's just, we're, we're really weaving together something that I think our pandemic has made possible at a whole new level, because we are 
able to connect in Zoom and it's maybe not the same as face-to-face, -face, but it also has something different that's kind of precious and important, right? There's people here from Vietnam and from, um, uh, you know, I, I uh, really from all over, I was catching a few places and now I'm um, I'm just so caught up all over the US and, and, um, and really all over the world that we've been able to connect uh, New Zealand. That's what I saw, what I saw here. Um, I don't know what time it is in New Zealand right now. I'm kind of curious, uh, maybe it's morning, um, you know, in Canada and, um, and Australia. So, so we've got this capacity all of a sudden that no matter where we are in the world, we have this global community. And to feel that we're coming together around grief and trauma recovery, as a collective, whether that's you personally, and I think to some degree that's all of us personally right now in what our world is going through, this is impacting all of us. And also many of us, and I saw this in the chat, are also here serving others in a variety of ways. That, that you know, our own um, kind of attending to our own personal uh, inner world is what makes it possible for us to be a presence for other people in their healing journey and, and in their um, uh, kind of discovering a sense of hope in the midst of challenge. So I was sharing with um, Brad and Darren and Andy before we began that, you know, it's an interesting topic to come in mid pandemic and to speak about post-traumatic growth at a time when we are still within um, a significant chronic ongoing stressor, ongoing adversity. And so part of what I'd love to invite you to think about, um, you know, uh, in this process is that the same strategies or, um, or behaviors or mindset that fosters growth after a traumatic event can also, also foster growth in the midst of challenge, in the midst of adversity. And uh, whether that's, you know, attending to grief, attending to vulnerability, and of course, we'll, we'll dive in through some slides into a bit more of what's going to support us during this time and, and for many, many years to come, because I really have the sense that we will be processing this for a long time. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I periodically will have these moments of almost like like realizing what it is that we are all collectively going through. And the enormity of that is so significant. I see you're nodding, Debbie, right? Like it's so significant. And then it's it's like, I have to tuck it away because to be with the reality of this is so, is so big. And so part of the, the reason why we need community is to help us hold something that is so much bigger than us whether that is your own personal loss or this experience of a collective event that is, that is impacting us. And you can add into that mix climate change. And you can add into this the, um, you know, the experiences of emergence around the recognition of imbalance of power for minorities and people of color and indigenous peoples and black people in, in, in this world, right? So we, we have this, this, you know, multiple layers of healing that are, are happening right now, I believe on our planet, that, that really need forward thinking and need our own commitment to our own personal healing, as well as how do we contribute to that for that collective as well. So that's my intention. Uh, to, it's, it's tonight here. I see some people are saying it's 2 p.m. in other parts of the world or whatever time of day it is for you, or if you're watching this by recording, it's really my intention to offer some guidance of how we can um, facilitate a sense of, of hope as we are progressing through this and, and moving forward and hopefully finding our way out of this, uh, this narrows that we're in right now. Um, before I bring up the slide, I'll just share that narrows reference for a moment. So um, I uh, love the outdoors. If any of you know me well, or if we're on Facebook together, many of you know that about me. And um, so I spend a lot of time either, you know, hiking in the canyons of Utah or in the mountains of uh, Colorado or on rivers um, uh, in the Southwest. And when you're 
Um, hi, Joy, it's good to see you. When we're, you know, when we're um, in a river, or when we're going through the desert, um, sometimes those, those canyons get real tight, right? And when the canyon gets tight, it has a very different feeling where you have to kind of squeeze or navigate your way through. Or when the river is running through that narrows, the rapids get, get tighter and, and the flow gets um, more intense. And I think collectively we're in a narrows right now. You can almost think about it as kind of being, being put through a birth canal. And, you know, ideally we're going to have some midwives to facilitate this transformational phase so that we can actually have a supported birth. We can have a supported transformational process. So my hope is to kind of help facilitate that with, with my own um, kind of you know, years of attention focused on what really facilitates trauma recovery, what facilitates growth and resilience in the midst of hardship. And that also that knowing that you are, um, that you are midwives in your own ways for your own process, perhaps for family members, perhaps for your communities. So um, just really a joy to be here with you. I'm going to pull up some slides at this point. And for those of you that have been in presentations with me before, you know that one of my favorite things to do is periodically take those slides back down so that I can connect with your faces, because that is what I love the most about this, uh, especially these live events. So we'll go back and forth between some information sharing and some connecting. So here we are kind of deepening into resilience and post-traumatic growth and uh, within this context of the Phoenix Rising theme with Reimagine. So I would love to invite you to take a moment as we arrive just a bit further in our process together and just check in with yourself. And we've done a little bit of this together through the chat, but also just to take a moment and notice your own quality of mind. What are the kinds of thoughts that you're having right now? What are you bringing into this event? Perhaps from your day thus far, what's happening in your world? Knowing that your worries are welcome here, your curiosity is welcome here that there is no right way to be in that state of mind, that actually the more that you are just present and genuine and authentic with what is present for you, I have a sense that you'll feel more, uh, more grounded and present to this experience. I invite you to notice your body. The quality of any physical sensations, areas of tension, areas of ease, maybe a little bit of both. I invite you to notice your breath. And sometimes as soon as we bring the breath into the mix, it's like we wanna change it. We wanna take that deeper breath, but just notice if there's holding, if there's restriction and to honor that, that, that anytime there's tension or holding, that it's got information for us. And if we tr quickly try and make it go away, we might miss the message. I invite you to notice any emotions that are here for you. Again, a way of allowing yourself to be even more present. You know, this quality of all of you is welcome here. And just noticing your level of energy. Uh, do you feel tired or energized without making one or the other wrong? And perhaps with this deepened awareness of what you are bringing into this space, you might ask yourself, what is it that you need right now to help you be most present for this time that we have together. And that need might be facilitated by just a little bit more self-compassion. 
and even asking your body, do you want to be sitting up? Do you want to take this information in laying down? It's one of the most wonderful things about learning from your own space, learning from your own home is that you can lay in your bed in your PJs or with your have your favorite cup of tea, right? So just allowing yourself to really tune into what's going to support this learning experience for you and this this workshop as well, this kind of deepening into your own your own being. And we'll dive into just a little bit of the arc of what we're here to explore. So in the post-traumatic growth guidebook, I offer up a understanding, an understanding of trauma recovery and um, as a hero or heroine's journey. And this is described as a monomyth by Joseph Campbell, pardon the typo there. He's um, really recognizing that there's this arc that we can see and we find it in mythology and we find it in our movies and we find it in some of our favorite books and, and we find it in ourselves, right? It's, it's also very relevant to trauma recovery. And you can think of this as um, the monomyth that begins with a cycle of freedom or innocence that gets disrupted by a crisis and it sends us into exile. Maybe it sends the whole world into quarantine. This is a call to enter the hero's journey. But very often, one of the steps along this journey is that there's a an urge to reject the call, right? We want to avoid the, the difficulty. We want to not touch those hard feelings. We don't want to do the hard work of healing. And suddenly we find ourselves isolating or we, we um, avoid going to places that might touch off difficult feelings or we um, get caught up in addictions or we just start to simply disconnect from our emotions and we start to feel like we're just going through the motions of life. We don't feel connected to anything that feels meaningful. And in order to overcome these challenges, the hero, we must seek supportive resources to help us face our fears or fight those dragons, you know, turn towards those inner demons and dance with them, as Brad said. And ultimately, it's that process of turning to face the very thing that we would rather hide and run away from and avoid and pretend it doesn't even exist. But when we turn to face it, it allows us to retrieve something very important. And what we are retrieving is inside of you. It's not out there. It's inside the felt experience in your heart. It's inside of the very pain that you've turned towards, right? When we have a discomfort, whether it's somatically in your body through chronic pain or, or that tightness in your shoulder or that, that catch in the breath, and actually when we turn towards it and we contract around it and we bring our attention to it and we feel it and we feel the tenderness and the vulnerability and the rawness, that it is through that that something new emerges, right? There's a felt sense of empowerment that we, that we access or this recognition that there was something that our body was holding for us for many, many years sometimes, all the way going back to childhood or is even sometimes it goes back generations and all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, that was in there and my body held this until I was ready to feel it. And so we retrieve that treasure, that sense of freedom or that renewed sense of possibility. That sense that there were people around us that actually were there to you know, support us and help us and bring us meals or knock on our door and ask if we were okay. And we just didn't know that they were there because we hadn't realized that we needed to call upon them, right? That we weren't vulnerable enough yet to see that those supportive resources were around us. And eventually once we find that treasure, we come back full circle. And this is a key part of the hero's journey because once we discover our gifts and capacities, we need to bring them back. We need to actually pay that forward. We need to give back to our communities. And it's actually what supports the very process that we just went through. 
And sometimes it's not just a single arc of a hero's journey that any of us do inside of our our lifetime. Maybe we go through this in multiple rounds, right? That we have gone through experiences in early childhood, and then we had a, another loss in our 20s, and then we faced a loss in relationship with a loved one. And, and we have other experiences throughout our lives. And, you know, but each time, once you have actually gone through this arc, you are better prepared for the next challenge. Right? There's this beautiful research on resilience that says that people who have previously worked through traumatic events in their own therapy were actually more resilient when they had to face a future event. So the hero, and I love this particular conceptualization, becomes a mature adult. And what does that mean? It means that we're more capable of holding complexity and, um, and complex feelings and ideas and differences and conflicts in negotiating those experiences. And you know, it's what we hope to see in our leadership, but it's often lacking. And so when we can't rely on the leader that's meant to be the hero, that's meant to model that, whether that's in your own family or whether that's a leader of your country, that what we then have to do is become the person that we hoped to have. And it's so hard when you have to become that mature adult when you never had one growing up and you have to surpass the developmental level of your own parents, right? It's hard and it's rewarding both. Very often, what fuels this is this recognition that it's our job to stop the legacy of pain, whether that's preventing from passing it on to your own children, if you have children, or stopping from preventing it on to your communities or to, to other people that you interact with, right? So that we no longer become the, the, the source of the, the people upriver that are, that are contaminating the, that river for the people downstream. Right, so that we take self responsibility. That's the mature adult. For and we take responsibility for the wake that we leave behind. That's what lets us become the leader, the healer, and the guide for others. So, what is this phoenix rising? It's a search for meaning, and it's a result. Meaning is the result of actively committing yourself to the task of working through despair in order to find hope for your future. And it's not the same as saying that all things happen for a reason. In truth, any story can bind you or free you depending on how it's, how it's told, right? It's, it's, you know, we're not saying that those bad things happened in order for you to grow. You grew because you took the hard things that happened and you worked through them. Right? That's a very important distinction. And it really takes out that kind of new age. Um, I was about to curse, which maybe you don't want on your recording, but you all know what came through my mind, right? All right, that new age crap that basically gets funneled into like, oh, well, you'll be stronger because of that thing that happened, or it was meant to be, or wow, look at, you know, like, mm -mm. no, bad things happen and they happen to good people. Right. And we have to reconcile with what am I going to do with that? Not because it happened in order for me to grow, but because I can grow because I'm willing to do that hard work. So it's this question of can you give yourself permission to grow, to imagine a future that's filled with new possibility? Can you stand inside of that space, that unknown between who you became as a result of those difficulties and who you would like to become. And there is that process, you can think of it as holding on to the, to, you know, the, the one trapeze bar and being willing to let go of that, that identifying with the pain, the identifying with the negative beliefs, the identifying with the shame or that it's your fault. And as we let go of that, there is the suspension between that, that known, that identity and something new that we're going to evolve into. And it's terrifying sometimes to let go of the felt sense of self that oriented around the pain or the becoming small or the contraction. 
because we had to do that and we had to grow around that seed that got planted there, even if it wasn't the seed that was ever going to foster your growth. So the question is, what do you want to grow into and become that will help you give to the next generation? As we come into just some basics here of what are we, what are we really talking about? Resilience is about our capacity to adapt well in the face of adversity. And it is both a psychological and a physiological capacity to become flexible in response to stress or difficult events. So we become more psychologically flexible and being able to, to not just get stuck in those kind of tracks of negative beliefs or thoughts, um, or to be able to turn towards difficult emotions with more compassion, right? That's gonna facilitate more psychological flexibility. Our physiological flexibility shows up as we are actually able to better tolerate stress without getting stuck in states of anxiety and panic or experiences of shutdown and collapse and depression and nothing I do is going to make a difference, that learned helplessness. So we actually learn to be able to move between states of stress and um, and tolerate more fear or more discomfort without getting stuck in that. And we can actually reclaim our capacity to rest and to soften and to, um, and to sleep well without collapsing into not wanting to get out of bed, right? So we're actually reclaiming more physiological capacity to handle more challenge. One of the, you know, the things that I've seen over the years is that sometimes people who have experienced um, profound adversity, their lives get smaller and smaller, right? And they don't want to leave their houses or they're, they're stuck inside of chronic health issues. And then they're afraid to stretch and they're afraid because, oh my goodness, they're going to feel more. So we have to have that capacity to grow and be able to feel more. And most of the time we need support to build that. And that's what we call co-regulation. It's, it's a, a fancy phrase that basically says we can hold more together. Because in order for me to be with my own pain, whether it's emotional or physical, um, it really helps to know that there is somebody else there willing to be in relationship with me in, in, um, and who is not afraid of those experiences that I might bringing, be bringing into the experience, into the exchange. So when we talk about post-traumatic growth, it's those um, outcomes of an improved self-perception or an enhanced relationships and a strengthened life philosophy that can occur after a traumatic event. We'll get more into that. That was a quick brush on it, but trust me, we're gonna be spending more time there. So the questions of resiliency, right? Why do some people respond better to traumatic experiences than others? What are the coping mechanisms and behaviors that are associated with the greatest adaptation to traumatic or adverse life events? And what are the most effective means of integrating these strategies into our lives? The psychological factors of resilience, I just wanna say that resilience isn't something that you're born with, right? It's not something that you either have or don't have, it's actually something that you build. And so it involves behaviors and thoughts and actions that you can learn and practice and relearn and repractice and develop and cultivate in yourself. And so some of these, and, and we'll go into you know, more as we go along, but some of these are the belief that growth and wisdom can be gained from difficult or challenging life experiences. So even though it's hard, how can I grow from this hard thing? Another one is that rather than lapsing into passivity and powerlessness, it is the belief that with effort, you can influence the course of your life, the events of your life. Now, you know, we can't change everything. There's a little bit of a serenity prayer here. I always think of like, okay, I want to identify what can I change and what can't I change? I can't really change the pandemic, but I can change how I respond within it. I can change, you know, I can commit to, 
going on walks and um, reaching out to people rather than isolating, which is going to tie us right into this next, next one. I can commit to attending to my physical health, eating well, so that there are things inside of my control that are going to lead to a better outcome, right? Commitment being one of those, which is this, this that the individuals who stay involved and um, stay engaged in ongoing events rather than isolating tend to have a better outcome in the midst of adversity or, or traumatic life experiences. So all of you are, are you know, fueling your resilience right now by being here. And I'll add to this action. And I think this is a beautiful element of what Reimagine is, is supporting in the world is that when we commit to and take steps to change or even radically transform the systems that have been the source of adversity, that we are actually taking part in shaping our world in a direction that we'd like to see it become. So maybe it's that participation in really creating a family and, and how you raise your kids that's going to transform your own family system right, from how you were raised or how your parents were raised. Maybe it's creating changes at a societal level or a cultural level so that we can, you know, really profoundly impact the world that we live in. I love this particular quote. This is about resilience and cognitive flexibility. And so this uh, phrase here that people who are resilient tend to be flexible, flexible in the way that they think about challenges and flexible in the way they react to react emotionally to stress. They're not wedded to a specific style of coping. Instead, they shift from one coping strategy to another, depending on the circumstances. Many are able to accept what they cannot change, to learn from failure, to use emotions like grief and anger to fuel compassion and courage, and to search for opportunity and meaning in adversity. So a lot of this, what we're speaking about here relies on the science of neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is basically just saying that our brains are more, uh, more fluid and flexible and spongy and, and uh, mutable than they are fixed. Our brain is changing with every life experience and continues to grow throughout our lifespan. Even our memories of difficult events from the past, they're malleable, they're, they're, they're amendable, um, and that our brain and body and physiology are constantly being influenced and changed. So one of the ways that we facilitate change is this kind of dual action of recognizing that we must consciously inhibit old, ineffective habits or responses to the world while we simultaneously repeat and intentionally develop new, more adaptive responses. So I'll pause my slide for just a moment and I'll just share a brief story where we can see each other a little bit more clearly. So, um, you know, here, I was, I was mentioning this earlier, I love to spend time out in the open space of Colorado. And, you know, when we're going out into our public parks, and I'm sure that you have these in your communities, we all have those parks where sometimes someone kind of trampled off the path and they, you know, kind of went right across the, uh, the park and someone followed suit and another person followed suit. And the next thing you know, you've got this kind of muddy path that's going from like, well, I thought it was faster to go from here to here, right, right across that diagonal line, right? And then, you know, what do we have but kind of an unwanted trampled section of the park. And so what happens next is thankfully our people that are attending to the, the park development and, and, you know, what direction do we want to go here, they're going to put up some signs that they're saying we're rehabilitating this grass, we're rehabilitating this field. So we're going to redirect the traffic. And so we're going to put up signs on both ends of this, and we're going to allow that section to heal as we redirect the traffic onto the wanted pathway. And I'd love for you to take that metaphor into your own life of in what ways does your mind take you down the unwanted path? In what ways do you um, uh, behave in ways or take actions that aren't as nourishing as they could be for your health, right? In what ways maybe do you isolate 
rather than reach out to other people? And how can you redirect the traffic inside of yourself, within your behaviors, the actions that are in your control? Thanks, Brad, I got that. <laughs> it's like, you're on a roll, just keep going, honey. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to offer up uh, the model that it forms the foundation of the post-traumatic growth guidebook. And this is the six R's of neuropsychotherapy. So the first, and really what we're talking about, what is neuropsychotherapy? It is the understanding of how we facilitate neuroplasticity. And the six R's are the different um, pathways that we can move in that direction. The first is relating. Our brains are wired for and are strengthened by connection. All right? So as we reach into community, you're already facilitating growth. And every time we have a moment in relationship where we experience connection that's meaningful, we have a felt sense of being seen or understood, we're nourishing ourselves in that wanted pathway. We're taking ourselves in the direction that we wanna go. And especially if you have a history of feeling like you didn't belong, uh, feeling like you were uh, the, the odd person out, right? The, the black sheep of your family, the scapegoat in your family. If you have felt like um, you didn't really have community, any time that we repair that wound by having a new sense of belonging, we're directing the traffic in the wanted direction. We're repairing something really deep at the lower, you know, kind of mid and lower parts of the brain here that are deeply wired for that sense of attachment and belonging that goes all the way back to the earliest felt sense of self. We strengthen our, our physiology and our psychological resilience through resourcing, in which we're strengthening those felt sense of, of in the body and in our brain for positive experiences. We're letting those positive states grow. We facilitate growth through what I call repatterning or in the somatic experiencing or somatic psychology arena, the body-centered psychotherapy, we're really integrating a new felt sense of self that maybe allows us to come out of states of freeze or chronic fight flight or chronic collapse in which we feel helpless. So that we have a new capacity to feel like, like I have a range of motion in my body. Uh, you know, many of you know this about me, but if you don't, I'm a, a yoga teacher uh, and I've been teaching trauma-informed yoga for many, many years. And it's what I love about integrating embodiment in yoga is that we can stand up and feel empowered. We'll do a little bit of movement together before we close tonight. We can feel grounded in the body. We can feel an opening of our hearts. We can feel the capacity to reach through our arms. And all of that is integrating a new felt sense of self. Reprocessing, I'm a, an EMDR, um, uh, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's a form of trauma therapy uh, that I love so much. And in EMDR, we talk about reprocessing traumatic memories, where we're basically taking memories that they themselves got kind of like quarantined off or exiled off and, and feel disconnected from our resources. And we're taking those difficult life moments and we're connecting them two times when we felt resourced and empowered and um and grounded in a sense of possibility. So we're, we're taking those old experiences and we're connecting them to more and more positive states so that we feel more integrated and whole. And we'll talk more about this meaning making and what Dan Siegel refers to as coherence um, as a process of reflecting on our life experiences and writing about them and getting a sense of who am I? How have all of the life experiences of, that I've had, good ones, bad ones, how have they all informed who I am as a person? How do they inform the decisions that I make, the reactions I have? How can I use that information to make wiser choices? 
and resilience, which we've really been speaking about here all along, that capacity to adopt new behaviors and beliefs that help us cope well in the face of adversity. So resilience and post-traumatic growth, they are both a process and an outcome. As a process, we're gonna work through vulnerable emotions with social support, with the right support or that co-regulation. We're gonna challenge those negative thoughts and beliefs. We're going to explore meaning-making through that cultivation of a coherent narrative, which we'll play around with together. We're going to cultivate some resources to handle adversity and we'll tap into what are your resources. We explore embodiment and a felt sense of empowerment. And we learn to transform learned helplessness into learned optimism. And the outcome of post-traumatic growth is that we cultivate a greater sense of choice in the here and now. We cultivate a sense of freedom and we recognize I'm no longer defined by the past. We develop a capacity to live in, live in and accept the world as it is and simultaneously take part in creating meaningful change for an improved future. We can say this happened to me and it's over now. Hopefully at some point we'll be able to say that about our pandemic. And I'm strong and capable of handling challenge with support. This you know, piggybacks on the list that Brad shared at the beginning of some of those factors in Richard Chodesky's work of, um, of what are the outcomes of post-traumatic growth, right? Discovering new strengths, enhanced personal relationships, increased willingness to ask for help, a willingness to be vulnerable, an increased recognition that there are new social supports that I didn't even know were there. Increased appreciation of life and maybe a willingness to take it easy. Newly found interests or passions and even spiritual discoveries. By the way, I'll share with you that pretty much every photo that you see in this presentation is my own. Uh, it's my passion to, um, to take sunset photos. And if you like more of them, if you find me at Dr. Arnold Schwartz on Facebook, you'll see them pretty much every day. <laughs> so that's a fun thing that I like. Um, so coherence, I brought this term up before. A coherent self is the ability to talk about how the past has shaped your behaviors, your beliefs, and your relationships. It's the ability to make meaningful connections out of complexity of diverse life experiences. And again, it helps us hold dichotomies and polarities and conflicts and disappointments and contradictions. And it's why I often say that trauma work is world work. Right? And that if more of our world leaders did their trauma work, we'd have a world that could handle conflict in a whole different way. So an oscillating narrative in the research about resilience is a narrative that actually is inclusive of the ups and downs of your history, your own personal history, maybe your generational history, right? Perhaps it's the, the challenges faced by your ancestors, right? And how they navigated those challenges. Why are you here today? How did their capacity to navigate those challenges allow you to be alive? Right. So the, the oscillating narrative integrates the hard stuff and the good stuff. Right. And it creates a cohesive whole. This co coherence is a mindful reflection. It allows you to take responsibility for your life now so you can create your future. We recognize that adversity is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. And it's part of the story, but it doesn't determine the rest of the story. I'll read this quote from the Post-Traumatic Growth Guidebook. Over time, you take the many threads of your life experiences and weave them into a single fabric. You weave in your strengths and your struggles. You begin to notice patterns and themes. Most importantly, you recognize yourself as the weaver. You learn that you can continue to integrate new threads at any time, for you are an active participant in the ongoing creation of your life story. And over time, the fabric that you create out of your life experiences begins to feel increasingly integrated and whole. 
I think of it as that fabric, of course, that then we can kind of wrap around us like a warm blanket. Now your life story can help you identify new possibilities for your future. You might even discover that your fabric is inextricably woven into the fabric of all life. 